Wobble on out of my way, please. <laughs> morning. Morning. The Lord greets us today from John chapter 10 verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Greetings in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome to Sovereign King Church. It is good to be, to be in the house of the Lord today. It's good to be here in this new facility and we are glad that you're with us. Whether you are a first time guest or a long time visitor, or remember, it's good to be here. We're here to worship the risen Lord with living hearts in reverent and holy worship. Before we begin our time of worship today, I want to take a few moments to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, it is good to be in a new facility. It's amazing how God has grown us from a basement, and now we, we have a, a new place to take over. Um, but there are a few little rules that we need to be aware of. And, and for one, the restrooms are not on this floor, they're downstairs, and uh, if your child 8 and under needs to use the restroom, please make sure an adult or a teenage sibling uh, escorts them downstairs. And if you need help, please don't hesitate to ask someone, they'll be glad to help you uh, if, you, if you need help getting your children down, downstairs. Uh, speaking of going up and down the stairs, I want to uh, tell the children that the stairs are place for you to go up or you down, but they're not, they're not a toy or a, a exercise place for you to go up and down, up and down, up and down. So uh, let's uh, make sure we keep the stairway clear, that way uh, uh, people aren't tripping and falling, or you're falling, going up and down the steps. We, we do have coffee and water available, but it is downstairs in the fellowship hall, and you can get it before the service, but we please ask you to keep it in the fellowship hall downstairs. There are no food or drinks allowed in the sanctuary uh, while we are worshiping the Lord. There's also a nursery area available downstairs, so if you need to, uh, uh, to nurse uh, or take a crying child out, well, we're very glad to have children with us, as you know. But there is an area down there, you'll see it, it's, it's kind of, uh, uh, I almost said encaged, but that's not the right kind of thing. <laughs> Huh? We have some cage, cage children. It's partitioned off. That sounds much better than cage. <laughs> down the stairs, through the door, down the stairs, left, down, left, left. Three lefts. Okay, yeah, there we go. And then, uh, as I've already said, please keep your children from running throughout the building. The walls in this place are very delicate, and so we need to be careful. Don't be uh, punching or pushing up against the walls. Uh, they will crumble. But... If we keep those things in mind, we do our best to be good stewards of the place that God has given us. God will continue to bless us and 
you'll be able to uh, find this will be a great facility and gives us room to grow. And that's what we're excited about. So that's the uh, housekeeping. We do have a few announcements. This coming Saturday, uh, we're having a stop sign outreach in which we're going to be here in, in, uh, in Jeffersonville. We're going to be uh, handing out tracts and pamphlets about the church. And so, Mr. Savey, what time and where? Uh, I don't recall the time or the where. I got to look at the schedule. <laughs> um, so, where was tentative, but I'm thinking we might do it up near the Big Four Bridge at that intersection right there. Okay. All right, so we'll give you a time. I'll send it out in all of our email channels when we get a little bit closer to that. And then on March 19th, we have our PA2 and our Geneva Pub the next day. And then something I want you to be uh, aware of that we're starting this year is uh, family game nights. And so uh, we usually have on Wednesday nights our young men's or young women's class or uh, women's Bible study. We're going to be doing once a quarter. Instead of joining those separately, we're going to all join together and, and the men too and do some family game night. And so March 30th, we'll be here and we'll be able to do our family game night then. And then April 15th is our Good Friday service. So those are our announcements. Uh, there's Women's Bible Study this week. And it's going to be here. And it'll be here at uh, 7 o'clock. So you'll be able to uh, be here for that. Any other announcements? All right. If there are no other announcements, let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship the Good Shepherd. He is the one who came and found his sheep. And, uh, and so what a, a great... God that we worship the great king. You know, as exciting it is to worship in a new place, let's not forget it's not about the place. We're here to worship the king. And so wherever we are, let's make that our focus. That we ought to be as excited and more excited about who we worship than where we worship. And so uh, we're going to take a few moments in brief silence, ask you to silence your cell phones, anything that be a distraction. And then we will, uh, in a moment, I'll ask you to stand and pray. Let's take a few moments in silence to prepare ourselves to worship the Lord. All right, please stand with me and let's, let's pray that our hearts and minds may be acceptable to our Lord. <laughs> Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are assaulted by many temptations. And as you know the weakness of each of us, let each one of us find you mighty to save. Lord, we pray that you would bless the the preaching of your word, the singing of your word, and you would give us hearts that are pleasing to you. And we pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Good morning and grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be upon you. Peace be upon you. There we go. Our Lord calls us to worship this morning from 2 Peter 2, 24 and Psalm 23. Behold, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed, for you were continually strained like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down.
Amen. Let's stay standing for a reading from God's law. started this morning, I just want to say something. Um, a lot of the uh, verses we've been looking at in Deuteronomy continuously point us back to all the good things God has done and all the ways he's been faithful and blessed us. And I want you to look around this morning. Um, there was like three families, and now look at us. We've, God has grown this church, and he continues to bless us, and so let's not let this blessing uh, pass us by this morning, okay? Amen. The songwriter wrote, Open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things from your law. As we come before a holy God and hear his word, may we have eyes open to the wonderful and fearful things from his law. May it move us to repent, repent and seek forgiveness, fear disobedience, and live in light of the grace we have received. This is the word of God. It is eternally true and applicable for all of life. This reading comes from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 10. All the commandments that I am commanding you today you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these forty years, that he might humble you, testing you, to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you and let you be hungry, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone. But man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Your clothing did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these forty years. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you just as a man disciplines his son. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, flowing forth in valleys and hills. A land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates. A land of olive oil and honey. A land where you will eat food without scarcity, in which you will not lack anything. A land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. You may be seated. As we peruse the pages of Scripture, what we see are covenantal promises made by God to His people, then varying degrees of fulfillment throughout the course of Israel's history. We see promises of land, an expanding nation, abundant food, and prosperity, and the reality that Israel would be a blessing to all the nations. We see promises that God would drive out all of Israel's enemies from before them, and that they would be blessed with rest from most enemies. We see these promises fulfilled through Israel's deliverance from Egypt, God giving a law and establishing them as a people, and God blessing them with the land over the Jordan, the land flowing with milk and honey. Arguably, in terms of Old Testament Israel, these promises peak under the reign of Solomon when we read, Blessed be the Lord, who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise, which he promised through Moses, his servant. May the Lord our God be with us, as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to himself, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his ordinances which he commanded our fathers. We see God's promises fulfilled, yet within a few generations, the nation of Israel finds itself split in two, apostatizing and carried off into captivity in Assyria and Babylon. Salvation is of the Lord and he alone, Yet God's monergistic plans of salvation and deliverance for Israel did not negate man's responsibility for obedience then or in 2022. We read in the text today that God tested Israel in the wilderness, quote, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He reminded them of his provisions, the manna, the clothing that did not wear out, protection from physical ailments, and then he declared, therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. Because of their unbelief, the nation of Israel became the natural branch, which was broken off from the vine with the Gentiles being grafted in as wild olive branches. Yet the conditions which God has placed upon the church 
remain the very, very much the same today. Jesus says to his disciples in John chapter 15, verses 10 and 14, he says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You are my friends if you do what I command. So what does all this have to do with us here this morning? Obedience to the word of God is not optional. We see in the text today that blessings accompany obedience to God's law. And on the flip side, curses accompany disobedience. Curses like being carried off into captivity and broken off from the vine and cast into the fire. We know that obedience apart from faith avails us nothing but damnation because we are saved by grace through faith, not by our works. Yet, just as God provided the manna from heaven, which they did not know, by his word that they might live by it, we are called to live by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. God's word is to be our food, and our obedience to it blesses us with life. Jesus said as much in John chapter 4. He says, it says, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. You see, brothers and sisters, faith and the obedience to God's law, which follows from that, is how we live out the idea that we live by every word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. This is where abundant life is found. This is where joy in the midst of trials is found. This is where hope in a world gone haywire is found. This is where your appetites are satisfied. This is where peace in the midst of the storm resides. Faith in Christ Jesus and his finished work and works done in obedience to God's law, being a hearer of God's word and a doer, is how we can rest easy knowing that God is bringing us into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without scarcity, in which you will not lack anything, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. And so what might this look like in practice for us as a church? Jesus tells us in John chapter 15, These things I have spoken to you, and this is in regard to the branches that were broken off and those that didn't bear good fruit. He says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. Brothers and sisters, God is bringing us into a new era in the life of this church. This building, its location, and the expectations which accompany us here as we enter into this new phase will challenge us as a body in ways we have not been challenged thus far. The ways in which we minister to one another will increase, as will the ways in which we are tempted to sin and will sin against one another. So the question is, how will we respond to that? Will we feast upon God's word, walking in obedience to it? Or will our preferences, our individual appetites, our attitudes, our wishes and desires lead us to bitterness, backbiting, division, and ultimately being broken off the vine and cast into the fire? Will we view the challenge of meal trains and cleaning schedules and work days and outreaches, fellowship meals, needy brothers and sisters, enemies knocking at our door, and the disciplining of ourselves and our children as blessings in the midst of a time of proving, will we view this as a challenge, you know, as a blessing to us, or will we grow bitter and grumble as the Hebrews did in the wilderness and were subsequently kept out of the promised land? So this morning, if you are able, let us kneel as we confess our sins to God our Father, who loves us and disciplines us as sons. Heavenly Father, just as you called Abraham out of his pagan life to an unknown land and future, you call us to trust and obey. Father, Sovereign King Church is stepping out in faith as we move locations, going from a place of comfort and familiarity to one ripe with unknowns and expanded responsibilities. Please fill us with your spirit and enable us to say with King David that our cups run up over. Please guard us from grumbling, strife, backbiting, and unrighteous conflict. 
Help us be thankful for your blessings and provisions and to walk in obedience by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. Help us to love one another and to be a beacon of light in dark Jeffersonville. Please forgive us when we trust in the modern equivalent of chariots and horses rather than in your only son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Please stand and listen to the comforting assurance of the grace of God promised in the gospel to his church. This is John chapter 10, verses 7 through 15. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. To all those who thus repent and seek Jesus Christ for their salvation, their sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord.
and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We have sung our Lord's praise, and now we've confessed our faith. Let us hear a word now from our Lord, found in the Holy Scriptures, in the book of Romans, chapter 9. The Apostle Paul writes to us there. Bible reading comes from the letter to the Romans, chapter 9. This is the word of God, it is eternally true and applicable for all of life. I am telling the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption of sons, the glory, and the covenant, the giving of the law, the temple services, the promises, whose are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all, God bless, forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For they are not all Israel, who are Israel, who are descended from Israel. Nor are they all children, because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac, the descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there is Rebekah also. When she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born, had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. And it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it does not depend on man who will, on the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I raised you up, to demonstrate my power in you, and to my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and pardons whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? If the thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another another for common use? What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience the vessels of wrath for destruction. And he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of him which he prepared before him for glory. Even us, whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also among the Gentiles. And he says also to Hosea, I will call those who were not my people, and her who 
is not my beloved. Beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out, of course, concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us, had left to us a posterity, we would have become like Sodom and would have resembled Gomorrah. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, not arrive at that by way. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. Just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Word of the Lord. Soldiers of the cross, 12 years and under, stand up, stand up for Jesus and in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Wow, we're filling up both sides here. Maybe we need to separate the sheep from the sheep. The big sheep from the little sheep. Hey, go ahead and file over this way so you can see the screen up here. We've got a little different setup here. You guys aren't used to this, but let's let's go ahead and file over here towards this way. All right. Step right. Step right. Step right. There you go. All right. Good morning, everyone. I missed you last week, but my aim's getting better. There we go. All right. We got a we got some new ones here this morning. All right, so you guys know the drill. I'll say the question. Can you see it up there okay? I'll say the cue, the question, and you wait for the preparatory command answer. Uh, and then you, let's test out this building and see if it shakes as much as the stairs shake when you trample down on it. All right. Here we go. Now, this morning we're talking about sheep. How many of you have uh, been to the zoo or have you you've seen sheep? Yeah. Have you ever tried to herd sheep? Have you ever tried to try to get sheep to go where you want to? You know what would the sheep? What would the, if you got two shepherds there and one's used to shepherding the flock and one of them doesn't know anything about the sheep and not, <clears throat> and one of them says the guy that's been with the sheep he says come follow me sheep. Which one is he going to follow if both of them say that? The one he's been with the, the shepherd that's been with the sheep. Yeah. And so that's what we're learning about this morning is our, she our, our shepherd. You guys remember the, uh, the verse that we just read, one of the famous Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Remember that one? Y'all say that this morning? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Who has a problem with that one? Did anybody here want anything that they don't have? Yeah, we, we, we tend to have, want, have some wants, don't we? <laughs> What if your parents, uh, if you go into the grocery store, how many of you go to the grocery store, you know what the candy aisle is? Yeah, left to your own, which aisle would you go to? Would you go to the green pastures of kale and spinach and fresh vegetables? Or if left to yourself, would you go to your favorite aisle? And which one's better for you? Oh, yeah, my vegetables are good too. All right, so our shepherd leads us, and let's find out about our shepherd. Let's, let's learn about him. All right, here we go. Question. What does a shepherd do? One of the reasons that you're not answering right now is because you're used to the pattern that we've developed. And so we're going to continue to develop a pattern of being disciplined and restraining ourselves before we go, before we we're told to. So you guys are doing really good not to answer right now. You're waiting for the preparatory command answer. And uh, Henry, you're about
about to leave us, aren't you? Now, how many more days you got before you leave us? All right, but you remember that we're disciplined and we're going to go together and we're going to, we, we've done all these things and so don't lose sight of these things that you, uh, you follow after the good shepherd. All right, here we go. What does a shepherd do? Answer. A shepherd takes care of sheep by leading them, feeding them, and protecting them. That's right. Jesus leads us, he feeds us, and he protects us. Why would we follow after someone else? Question. Why do sheep need shepherds? Answer. Because sheep are helpless animals who can't take care of themselves and need protection from wolves and other predators. That's right. Sheep are helpless. Does God refer to us as sheep? Huh? You are my sheep. And my sheep hear my voice. He says, you are my sheep. But what are sheep? They're helpless. And they can't take care of themselves. And they need protection. Is that true? That's right. We need help. Because we're helpless against formidable foes. All right. Number next. Question. Why is Jesus called a shepherd? Answer. Jesus is a shepherd because he leads us, takes care of us, and protects us. He is the good shepherd who died for our sins. All right. Let's try to get together on that one. Let's not, let's not erase. Let's all do it together. Here we go. Question. Why is Jesus called a shepherd? Answer. Jesus is a shepherd because he leads us, takes care of us, and protects us. He is the good shepherd who died for our sins. Next question. Why are we called sheep? Answer. Because we are helpless to save ourselves and need God for the price to for us. Let's do that one again. Why are we called sheep? Answer. Because we are helpless to save ourselves and we need God to Christ. Yeah, we didn't fix that slide, did we? No. <laughs> that was on the that was on the list of stuff to do. All right. I guess the computer had it mind. Here's how it should read. Now you pick one or the other. It works both ways. It says because we are helpless to save our because we are helpless to save ourselves and need Christ to care for us. Amen. Amen. All right, we got our memory verse up there. All right, here we go. Say it with me, congregation. Let's help them out. John ten verse eleven. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. All right. Okay, you guys listening? I look up here. Let's get your uh, self-control hands. All right, in a moment, you're going to be at your seat, and you're going to be tempted uh, to look around. Hey, why don't you just take a look, look around here real quick. Look at these windows and these nice windows, beautiful scenery, the lights. All right, you're done now. Uh, now, okay, now let's focus our attention, and let's go and prepare ourselves for a meal. We're about to be fed the Word of God. And you're going to be tempted to to wander off or to doze off while you're being fed. But will a man fall asleep while he's eating? All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for these precious arrows that are about to be sent out into the world. We pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would equip the parents to teach them well, to sharpen the swords, Lord, with the word of God, and send them out as lights in a dark world, that they can hit the mark and bring you glory and honor all the days of their lives forever and ever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Savior said that his house is to be a house of prayer. And the Apostle Paul instructs us to pray on behalf of all people. And so today we're going to come to our time of pastoral prayer. 
And uh, we're going to pray today for, uh, we usually pray for sister churches and, and by name. We're going to pray for all the churches in Jeffersonville. Today we're going to pray that God would raise up faithful shepherds and pastors to preach God's word. We're also going to pray for our landowner today. So he's in the back. Uh, uh, wave everybody wave at Dave. <laughs> Pray for God. God would bless him. And, and also, as we move in here, we would be good stewards of what God has allowed us to do. And then lastly, we're going to pray for those in authority. We're going to pray for a city council member, uh, Scotty Maples. I also think he might be the sheriff or he's running for the sheriff. And so uh, uh, we're going to be praying for him today as well. So let's go to the Lord uh, in prayer for these, uh, our prayer concerns. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I thank you for your kindness you are the good shepherd, that we are helpless, that we uh, often fall in ditches, get ourselves in, into the stain of sin and uh, the effects of that, and yet you've been kind to send Christ who died on the cross, and your great mercy redeemed us. We thank you then that you gave us peace with you, you've also given us peace with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we pray now, Lord, Thank you for churches, and thank you for this church and your work here. Help us to be faithful, and we thank you for other churches that are proclaiming your word. We pray now for the church in Jeffersonville. We pray for all Christians that you would raise them up to be faithful, that they would be obedient to your commands, that they would proclaim your word, and that you would be proclaimed king here in Jeffersonville, that, that there would be nowhere we could go without hearing of your glory and seeing the mighty works that you are going through your people. We pray now, we thank you for this new facility that we get to meet in. We pray you'd help us to be a good uh, steward of this place. We thank you for David Hebner and, and his uh, willingness to rent it to us and, and help us to be able to get in here. We pray that you would bless him and his work and bless his, him, uh, and his family as well. We pray now, Lord, for those who are in authority. We pray for those who make decisions over this nation and state and in particular in this city. We pray for Scotty Maples and we ask you to give him wisdom that uh, he would rule by your word. The city council would, would actually be done promoting sexual filth in the streets of Jeffersonville, but instead would promote what is holy and righteous and good. So your name would be glorified. Lord, we pray now for the tithes and offerings that we're taking up, that they would be used for your kingdom and that you would... Uh, you would allow your kingdom to grow just as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right, the young men are going to take up the offering. Please come forward. I believe it's uh, Charles Spurgeon. And uh, you guys, I sent out the list. I think it's uh, Jeff. Oh. Jeff.
Let's stand, let's return praise for the Lord's many blessings to us. Praise God for So Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 through 14, this is the word of God and is eternally true and applicable for all of life. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. What do you think? If any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go and search for the one that is strained? It turns out that he finds it. If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Join with me in prayer that God will bless the preaching of his word. Heavenly Father, open my mouth that I might proclaim your truths. Give these people ears to hear. Give us hearts to do your will. Help us to seek you above everything. Help us not to despise the little, the little ones. But help us find our joy in you and to trust you. And help us to join in with the work as sons work for their fathers. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so even though we're here in a new building, we are going to pick up where we left off last week. The work continues, and our work through the Gospel of Matthew continues. Actually, there's going to be a little bit of an overlap. We briefly looked at verse 10 at the end of last week's sermon. And verse 10 says, see to it, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. Now, who are the little ones? Do you remember? <clears throat> Who are they? Children. Children. Well, yes, but they're the ones who are the greatest in the kingdom. And they are, those are the ones who are converted and made like children. That is, he's talking about humble believers who instead of seeking the world's approval 
are like children who seek their father's approval. They are the children of God. And they're like children. They're somewhat unequated with sin, but rather they're content to just know God. And these little ones are the ones that the world despises. And the enemy would seek to cause to stumble. And so Jesus tells his disciples, make sure you don't despise these little ones either. You know, the devil, the world hates Christians. You know that, right? right? The media mocks Christians. If you ever watch a TV show, you'll see them actually go out of their way to show sympathy to Muslims and for homosexuals or sometimes both at the same time. But it's very rare that they will portray a true conservative Christian uh, in good light. Usually they're the bumbling idiot or worse, the bad guy. Bible-believing Christians are despised. And that is as Jesus said it would be. Right? If they hated him, why should we think we should get any different treatment. They sped on, they mocked, they slandered, and they killed Jesus. And that, that's, that's kind of why I find it odd when people say something like, if only Christians were more like Jesus, then I wouldn't have such a problem with them. You know, Gandhi supposedly said, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians. And with the idea that if Christians were more like Christ, he would like them too. And while we can always be more like Christ, can we not? And that should be our goal. But being more like Christ won't get us less hate. It'll get us more. Why should we think that we are above our master? If he was persecuted, what should we expect? Now that said, it's one thing for the world to despise the little ones of Christ. But little ones are also tempted to despise other little ones. We're tempted to look down on our brothers and sisters in the faith. Right? The rich Christians are tempted to despise the poor ones. The poor are tempted to despise the rich. Blue-collar Christians are tempted to despise the white-collar. Country-living Christians are tempted to despise those who live in the city. And those who live in the city get all giddy about the city. They live in the city for the city. And they, the city just brings so much of the gospel to them. And so they despise the rednecks and the red states. We are tempted to despise each other, especially when somebody offends us. When one person sins against us, rather than recognizing the great debt that we owe to Christ and we're forgiven, all we can think of is the great debt that is owed to us. And how dare, how dare they offend me? We are also tempted to despise those who are brand new in the faith. Either because they're full of zeal, and that often puts us to shame, or because they don't know all the things that we have studied for so long. You know, we have a tendency, when you discover a new truth, to become really engaged with it. You read, and then you read, and you read everything you can about this new truth, and then you talk about it with everybody. It's what some people call the cave stage. You ever heard of that? It means when you discover a new truth, it, it, it might be good to put you in a cage till that zeal kind of chills out just a bit so that you're not harmful to others and to yourself. So like, you know, you can talk about other stuff, right? When you become a Calvinist, that's all you want to talk about. But then after you've studied it for a while and you become acquainted enough with this truth, your zeal starts to temper and then it becomes a settled truth in your mind. And then, here's where the temptation comes, it can almost become beneath you to talk to others who don't know as much about it as you do. You get the kind of, I've been there, done that attitude when some other brother in Christ starts to become interested in the truth. And then you don't have any patience for their cage stage. You all know what I'm talking about. Anybody out there, does this make sense? Heads not and helps. All right. You know, we are tempted to despise the, the little ones. We're tempted to despise small things. Now, Jesus is talking about people here, but it isn't limited to people that we despise as small. Scripture says, don't despise the day of small beginnings. And this is easy to do. You have this big project that you know you need to do, and then you don't even know where to begin. And so you have this grand goal in mind. You know 
know what you want to get to, and then you're like, I can never get there. So you just give up. It's tempting to despair the whole thing. I was talking with uh, my friend Tony Dupani. We, we do a podcast together. And we were talking about how there's this push to reclaim productive households, which is a very good thing to reclaim. You know, for most people, a house is just a place to sleep, to watch television, uh, maybe cook a meal. But Christians, we see the family as the basic building block of civilization. So we ought to make sure that our homes are not just a stagnant place for relaxation, but a place where every person is contributing and building up for the long-term benefit. And Tony and I were talking about how there seems to be some families that are really far down the path. And when you see it, you're like, man, they've got it together. And the problem is, it's when you're tempted to despise them. And you're tempted to despise the fact that you're not there and you don't know how you'll ever get there. And so if you're a man and you're just waking up to the reality of this is how it's supposed to be and I've let all this time slip by, it can be depressing to know where to start. And that's where if you despise the days of small beginnings, you never get started. All right? You see where you need to go and you're tempted. Maybe it's something like family worship. You haven't been doing it and you know you should, but when you sit down with your kids and your wife for the first time to do it, especially if they're older, it's odd, it's awkward, it's painful, and it's nothing like what you envision. Nothing. And so... But you know what? You have to start somewhere, right? It's those first days that lead to better days. And as a church, right, it's a blessing to be in this building today and to see your faces. It's, it's amazing to think five years ago we started off in a basement. And we had no clue what we were going. I'm not sure we still do. And it was tempting to be discouraged. You know, even now, it's hard if there's a fam one of your families are, are out and you're sick, we miss you, it, we notice you, we're glad to have you. But when you're in a basement with three families and one of them is sick, <laughs> you notice it, <laughs> for real. And so it's very difficult, to de and it's easy to despise a day of small beginnings. And having been saying that, I'm not saying that we have arrived. We haven't. Actually, the reason I'm bringing this up is because we're still in the days of small beginnings. And as a church, we aren't where we want to be. We have grown. We still have growing to do. We're coming into a city now. Jeffersonville has 50,000 people who live here. Clarksville next door has 22,000. And New Albany has 37,000. And that's only counting those who live in the cities proper. We are small beginnings here. So don't get so self-congratulatory about where we're at. We're just getting started. We have a gospel that needs to permeate this place. Christ needs to be acknowledged as king. And we are going to work here now in the midst of several apostate churches in a city that parades gay pride throughout its streets supported by those wicked churches. This is the day of the new and small beginnings for us. Furthermore, even among our own number, we haven't arrived. Many of you are new believers. You're growing in the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And those, some of you have been believers a lot longer. And guess what? Still small beginnings. You haven't even arrived. We also have young generations that we want to see transition from teenage years to adulthood. And in the process, pick up the torch and carry on the work. We do not want Sovereign King Church to be like one of those sparklers at 4th fourth, uh, fourth, uh, fourth of July that blow up and then they peter out real quick. Right? By God's will, we pray that our young men will become pastors and elders and deacons. We pray that young ladies become Titus II women. We want to raise up generations of children. You know, one of the goals of our church, 20-year goals that we put as we start to plant this church, and we're, we're on our way but we still got a way to go, is to have 200 children under the age of 10. So if you think it's crying and stuff now, that's where we're headed. Just get used to it. We want to see families thriving and faithfulness and fruitfulness blooming. It's my hope and prayer. I won't be able to see it because I won't be alive for it. But my prayer is that one day Sovereign Kingdom Church will be one of those churches where you go in and they have all the pictures of all the pastors over the last 100 years. 
We're not, we're not planting something that we hope will die out soon. And that means we can't despise today. We can't despise these days of small beginnings. We have work to do. We have work to do. We have more sheep together. We have Jeffersonville to invade. And so we are planting. We are still working. And that's because, speaking of work, work is a gift from God as he calls his people to work. God made us to work. When God made Adam, he placed him in the garden so that he would till and work the ground. Adam was made to take dominion. He was made to cultivate the land, to produce righteous culture. That's what we get the word culture from, cultivating. Work predates the fall of man into sin. Now, sin made it difficult. Sin makes it painful to work. Christ came, and part of the way, the reason he came was to restore us to the mission of taking dominion. He came to set his people back to work. And he did this by showing us that sons do the work of the Father. And this is in part how God designed us. Sons are to be like their fathers. Sons are like their fathers, actually. Uh, uh, just a, a week or so ago, we were in the van, we were going somewhere, and I was teasing the kids, asking if they want some ice cream. And when they said yes, I screamed. <laughs> so I gave him some ice cream. Did you want some real ice cream? Yeah. Then I screamed again. Do you want some more ice cream? <laughs> so now, so fast forward a few days, uh, we were actually talking about real ice cream <laughs> and asking if they wanted ice cream. And from the back of the van came this little voice from Ezra shrieking. <laughs> the son is like the father. Sons do the work of their father. Like when you go out to mow the lawn, my son wants to help me push it. And it's not just young sons. Right? I, I've really enjoyed watching Mr. Fleur, for example, and his sons. They were doing some work here in the building, and it was a joy to watch Dakota and Christian working right alongside their father. He would tell them what needs to be done, they would go do it. In fact, that's how it's been for most of human history. Right? If dad was a carpenter, you were a carpenter. If dad was a blacksmith, you were a blacksmith. And that family even becomes known as the Smiths. That's where we get the names. So, sons do the work of the father. And this is because the son does the work of the father. And that brings us back to our text. So, I haven't forgot it. I haven't become this weird guy that quotes a verse and then doesn't ever come back to it. So, we're in our text. And one of the reasons that we ought not despise the little ones is that they are the work of the son and the father. And this is what you see in verses 11 through 14. They are the work of the Son and the Father. Now, in verse 10, Jesus said, don't despise the little ones. He goes on to mention angels. We talked about that last week. I'm not going to go in detail other than to simply say, don't despise uh, God's little ones because they have a whole army. Like, if you go to war with them, they have the army of angels at, their, at God's call from them. But in verses 11 through 14... Jesus brings us his own work. And he brings forth his own work and then the will of the Father as a strong defense for his little ones. Right? You might be tempted to despise the little ones of God. You might be tempted to despise the new believers when they're just beginning their work on the days of new beginnings. But when you despise them, you're not just despising them. You're despising the handiwork of God and the purpose of Christ. So in verse 11, Jesus says this, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. And then in verse 14, Jesus says, So it's not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. Jesus talks about his mission. He came to save the lost. And then he talks about his Father's will. And we're going to see that the mission and the work of Christ is in perfect harmony with the will of the Father. In other words, Jesus is doing the will of the Father. The Son does the work of the Father. The Son does the work of the Father. Now, before I unpack this, hold that thought. There's something I have to deal with. And uh, I don't usually uh, bring this up because it sounds kind of nerdy. But we're going to talk about textual criticism. All right? What's that? Before you look at me like I just grew a third eyeball, let me explain. I'm going to try to handle it quickly and simply. But... Some of you, if you have in your Bible, you're going to notice something interesting with verse 11. And this is why I have to do this. So do some of you have in verse 11, it, 
that verse set out in brackets or parentheses? If you do, raise your hand. All right, if you have an ESV or a modern, more modern translation, it might go verse 10, verse 12. You might not have it, verse 11. Is that anybody? All right, you guys get new Bibles. <laughs> right, and you probably have a footnote at the bottom of the page that says something like, early manuscripts do not contain this verse. What's going on? Well, we have to talk a minute about how you got your Bible. You often hear atheists and unbelievers scoff at the Bible saying something like, how can we even know what the scriptures are? It's been translated so many times, we can't really know what the Bible is. Anybody ever come across that argument? Yep. And what they're alluding to is this idea that they've been taught to think of the Bible as the telephone game. And that's a game you get with a group of people where I whisper a secret into one person's ear, and then they whisper it into the next person's ear, who whispers to the next one, and down the line, down the line. And then it reaches the last person, and then that person shouts out what they've heard, and then you compare it to the original statement, and depending upon the group, they're often wildly different. And the telephone game works because you're only allowed to tell your neighbor once what you said, and you're whispering it to them so they may not correctly hear it. Furthermore, you might have some people who think it's funny to sabotage the game. <laughs> if you're playing with teenagers, that's usually what happens. And the end result is the process of one person copying another person's copy of copy, and the statement is transformed. And so skeptics think that is how we got the Bible. But it isn't. The Bible was written in time before copy machines and computers. It was handwritten on papyrus, and then it was sent to various churches. Like when, they, when Mark or Matthew wrote their book, they would send it to a church. And that church had a scribe whose entire life's duty was to accurately copy the original document by hand. Then, having copied that, they would pass on the original to the next church who would make a copy of it. And as time happened, you, probably around 100 years or more, the original document would be worn out, but there would be very many copies of the original. And then the scribes would carefully replicate their work. Daniel Wallace, who's a professor and an expert on Greek manuscripts, he explains how this is unlike the telephone game. This is what he says. He says, the transmission of scripture is not at all like the telephone game. First, the goal of the telephone game is to see how badly the story can get misrepresented. While the goal of the New Testament copying was by and large to produce very careful, accurate copies of the original. Second, in the telephone game, there's only one line of transmission. While with the New Testament, there are multiple lines of transmission. Thirdly, one is oral, recited once in another's ear, whispering, while another is written, copied by a faithful scribe who would then check his or her work or have someone else do, do it. Fourth, in the telephone game, only the wording of the last person in the line can be checked. While for the New Testament textual critics, we have access to many of the early texts, some going back very close to the time of the autographs or the, the original. Fifth, even the ancient scribes had access to earlier texts and would often check their work against a manuscript that was many generations older than their immediate ancestor. He says the average papyrus manuscript would last for a century or more. Thus, even a late second century scribe could have potentially examined the original document he or she was copying. And so if the telephone game were played the same way the New Testament transmission occurred, it would be make for the most ridiculously boring part of the game ever. Now, it's true that as scribes made copies, the scribes themselves were not perfect. If they made an error, they would sometimes discard the page, get rid of it, put it in the trash. Uh, but paper was very expensive. So sometimes, for example, if they were copying and they accidentally skipped the line, they would go back and in the margin write in what they were supposed to have. But if we look out of all the manuscripts and all the texts that we have of the Bible throughout the history, you will see that any of, the, of all the variants or differences, most of them, 70% of them or more, are simply spelling errors. For example, an extra letter was added to a word or a letter mistakenly taken off when the, the person was copying. 
And when translators look at the text, they can see that right away. Not an issue. Now, there's a few that are a little more substantial. Our passage today is one of those, and that's why I bring it up. The vast majority of manuscripts that we have today and that the church received for hundreds of years has this verse. So if you're wondering why it's in, in, the, in the Bible, because the vast majority of manuscripts that we have have it. But uh, in the 20th century, there were a couple of old manuscripts that were found. One was found basically in, in, a, in a trash heap that was in a garbage heap in a monastery. And then another one was found in the Vatican somewhere. And uh, for some reason, modern scholars like to think that these are more valuable than the fact that for the, the vast majority of all the other manuscripts agree. And so some modern scholars put a lot of weight on these. And therefore, they argue that this verse is not in the original. Instead, what they argue is that some scribe probably added this into the verse because it comes from the book of Luke. And so if you read the book of Luke, Luke says Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, I argue it's more likely that a scribe in one of those that manuscripts found in the garbage accidentally skipped the verse, and that's the reason it was in the garbage in the first place. And so the question is, what do we do with it? What do we do? How does this instill your confidence in God's word? Well, first of all, recognize this. The Bible is the most well-attested book we have in antiquity. Secondly, recognize that even variants like this do not change any doctrine of Scripture. Even if modern scholars are right, as they argue verse 11 is not in the original, the concept and teaching is still here, and it is still in the book of Luke, and the truth it contains is biblically sound. But having said that, I believe there's actually another reason that we can have even more confidence, and that is, if the majority of manuscripts have this verse, and if the church has received it for thousands of years, ought we not see God's hand of providence at work? and receive this description. The Westminster Confession, which is our guiding document, says this about Scripture. It says the Old Testament in Hebrew, which was the native language of the people of God of old, and the New Testament in Greek, which was at the time of the writing of it was most generally known to the nations, being immediately inspired by God, and by his singular care and providence kept pure in all ages, are therefore authentical. What's the Westminster teaching? It's saying not only was it immediately inspired by God, by his, but by his singular care and providence kept pure in all ages. It's basically saying that God preserves his word. He hasn't led his church astray. And therefore, I'm skeptical of modern skeptic-minded scholars who deny the inspiration of scripture when they want to take verses out. And say we have to go back and rework the text. Rather, I think we ought to receive what the Westminster says, but more importantly, what the Bible says, which is this. Matthew 5, 18, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Psalm 119, 89, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119, 160, The sum of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. Every one of them. God inspired the writing of Scripture, and I believe He inspired the receiving of it by the church. And we have the faith delivered once and for all. And therefore, I'm preaching this as God's Word. All right? So I hope you appreciated that little short uh, excursion. I didn't cover everything that possibly could be covered about that. But if you want to talk more about that, we can later. But let's get back to actually what the Bible says, okay? So we've been talking about the warning of Christ, don't despise the little ones. And we said one of the grounds or reasons for this is that these little ones are the handiwork of God. They're part of the purpose and mission of Christ and the will of God. Jesus came to save that which was lost. And then Jesus also says, the Father does not will that any one of the little ones be lost. Do you see here how the Father's will and the Son's purpose are one? The Father does not will to lose one of his little ones. And the Son came to save that which was lost. The Son does the work of the Father. 
Again, important to remember who he's talking about. Who are the little ones? We're talking about those who have been converted and are like children. We're talking about God's children. Those who are God. God's. The reason I bring that up again and made a point of it is because some people take this verse about the Father not willing that any little one be lost, and they twist it to argue against the doctrine of election. Now, what's the doctrine of election? Well, we had it read to us in Romans chapter 9 today. By the decree of God and for the manifestation of his glory, some men are predestined unto everlasting life and others are foreordained to everlasting death. Right? God has chosen his people before time began. And he chose it not based on any intrinsic goodness in his people, but because of his good pleasure to save them from their sins. Others he chose to pass over and leave in their sins. And so all deserve the wrath of God, but God being God and being gracious, he chose to save some people. And that is his prerogative. He's God. It's his will that he would choose. It's his will that he would not lose. Therefore, this passage is actually in harmony with this truth. God does not will to lose any of his little ones. Any of those he chose, he will not lose. It is his will to save them. Some twist this passage to make the father into some kind of wimpy weakling. Right? He just wishes everyone would be saved, but you, don't you know it's just up to them, and if they aren't saved, well, it wasn't his will's fault, but it's theirs that got carried out. They, they argue that God's will is that every individual on earth be saved, but God's will is thwarted by the will of individuals. That's not what Scripture teaches. These are God's children, those who are in the kingdom. And they are for those whom Christ came to seek and to save. It's talking about the lost sheep that are found. And it's saying that God's will is that none of them will perish. And the implication is not that God's will will not be met as if he's just wishing for something. But rather it's telling us what the plan is. He will save his people. He will not lose a little one. And this is the will of the Father, and it's carried out by the Son. Right? God does not will that one of the little ones would perish, and Christ came to save them. And here's the question for you. Do we not think that Jesus will do God's will? Right? Do we think Jesus will come and fail to keep God's will? Well, what does Jesus say? John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. The Son completes the will of his Father. The Son does the work of the Father. Jesus says in John 5, 17, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. Right? Again, if the Son is going the will of the Father, are we to say that the Son will fail to accomplish this? If the Son is sent to do the Father's work, are we to call the son of failure in that work? Again, what does Jesus say? John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And what is that will? Here's the will. This is the will of him who sent me, that, all, that of all that he has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. Again, in John 17, Jesus speaks to his success at this work. And he says this, While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus, he doesn't fail at his work. His work is to do the work of the Father. And this means that Jesus will save. Not just that he made salvation possible, but he will save those who are lost sheep. Jesus will save all those who are God's. Therefore, and here's why this is important to us, it ought to be a comfort to us. Christ will not lose his people. If your faith seems weak and you feel wrecked by sin, you look in the mirror and you think, how can anyone love me? God promises not to forsake you. He promises not to lose those who are his. This ought to be a comfort to the humble. What 
a joy for those who are despised by the world. It's not the Father's will to lose you, and it was the work of the Son to save you. You were like a sheep who were gone astray, but if you're God's, you will be saved. Your sin may seem overwhelming. Your temptations and burdens piled sky high, and yet if you are his sheep, and how do you know that? Well, if you have faith in Christ, even if it's weak, you will be saved. Or if you are humble, like a child, crying out only for the mercy of God, then you know you are his and he will save you. But for the proud who can never envision themselves as little children or as lost sheep, there is no help. There is no hope. And so speaking of sheep, why does God use the analogy of sheep for us? Why does he use that? Well, because if the analogy of children was not humiliating enough for you, he wants you to be humble. And so you're sheep. And what are sheep? Sheep are dumb. They're helpless. They can't fend for themselves. They stink. A lamb might be cute, but wait till they grow and they get covered in mud and poop. You know, we go to the state fair every year, and last year we got to see them show off the sheep. And it was kind of funny to me to hear the announcers talking about all the traits of the sheep. That they all look the same to me. <laughs> to my untrained eye, they all just look like sheep. They stunk. We got to see them be sheared, and, and they just kind of stand there while the trainer moves their legs and tries to get them into the box that they don't want to go into. And then they, they look like they're in a la la land, and uh, they fall a lot. They cried a lot. And then they got sheared. And then they came and ate. And the big grand finale was they got led around a ring. That, that was the big deal. Right? Some of the sheep had to be conjoled more than others. But it was a big deal to get them to walk around the ring. And that was all they did. It's not very uplifting to be called sheep. It's not a positive uplifting halo. Right? It's an insult today. Sheeple. Right? Nobody wants to be sheeple. And why is it an insult? Because sheep aren't strong. They're vulnerable to attacks. And some sheep will follow anyone. And yet, this is what God says about his people. We are sheep who have gone astray. In fact, in the Old Testament, the prophets speak of God's people as sheep who had both been led astray and wandered astray on their own. Jeremiah 56 says, My people have become lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray. They have made them turn aside on the mountains. They've gone along from mountain to hill and have forgotten their resting place. Ezekiel 34, 6 says, My flock wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. My flock was scattered over all the surface of the earth and there was no one to search or seek for them. And it was a pitiful shape the flocks were in. And how about in our day? Right? Again, we're now a church surrounded by other church. There's one here that goes by the name Presbyterian, and it's a shame to the name. They are flocks at least in name, but they are being scourged by false shepherds, promoting sexual filth and debauchery as kindness. The PC USA denomination has a statement, for example, saying that abortion is your Christian duty if you aren't filling up to the task of parenting. Pitiful. False shepherds lead people straight to the wolves because the false shepherds are wolves feasting on the flock. These are as Jude says, men, in our day women, who are hidden reefs in your love feast when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. Right, the sheep were in bad shape. And they're in bad shape in Christ's day, as you see in the constant clash he has with their shepherds, the Pharisees. But here's the good news. The sheep hear their master's voice. And if we are sheep, whom the Father has willed not to lose, we will hear our master's voice. And we hear it when his word is read and proclaimed, and we follow him. And therefore, we ought to be humble. Right? See, receive the preaching of God's word against our sins. Don't be led astray by pied pipers who lull you to sleep for the kill. 
Those that teach you, you're just good. You're not a sheep, actually. Why would you be a sheep? You're not a sheep. You're a bold lion. You don't need a defender. You don't need Christ. You're good. The proud will not inherit the kingdom of God. And those too proud to be sheep will be goats. You get to be animals either way. It stinks. Therefore, Christ humbles us with this analogy of sheep, but he also encourages us. And he shows forth his work as the one who came to save the lost. He's the good shepherd who came to save the sheep. And this good shepherd does several things, right? When he has lost sheep, he leaves behind the 99 that are safe. Jesus left behind his home in heaven. He left the comfort and glory and majesty of his throne to become one with man. He left behind the angels in glory who never went astray. Those were the 99 that he left. Whereas man was fallen like a sheep that strayed into the thicket and was lost. And so Jesus left glory and became man. He didn't stop being God, but he did lay aside the full glory of it to be united with us in our suffering. So that we would be united with him in his suffering and in his glory. Jesus says the man leaves the 99 and then he goes. He goes looking for the sheep and he searches for the sheep. It is Christ who comes to the sheep. And we should remember this when we think about growing this church. We will get some sheep who are saved that might come visit us, but we need to be more like Christ and be going. It's part of the mission of the church. You know, sometimes the church can become so insular, only dealing with its own problems. But part of the solution to dealing with your own issues from Christ's vantage point and what he tells us is actually to give yourself to others. I think we're going to put up a sign that says humility is not, uh, uh, what does it say, Sarah? She's not here. Uh, what does it say, Sarah, the, the sign? C.S. Lewis quote. There we go. Humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. And part of the, the solution to dealing with your issues is to simply think of yourself less. It's not necessary to take an inventory, right? To spend your life trying to recount every past issue. Now, it may be good to work through some of your past sins and do that by confessing and repenting of them. It's good to talk to your pastors and elders and deal with this. But we need to be mindful that as we do pastoral ministry and issues, there's a, there's a goal. And the goal is the work of the Lord, the ministry. And that involves loving our neighbors. It involves being like Christ to go and find the sheep. And as a church, we must be faithful to follow the model of our shepherd. The idea is that sinners are just seeking God is a lie. Sinners are seeking God in the same way a thief looks for a police officer. They ain't doing it. It's Christ who seeks sinners. He seeks the lost. The lost can't find themselves. That's why they're called lost. Right? If they knew where they were and where they were supposed to be and how to get there, they wouldn't be lost. But Jesus is the one who comes and seeks us. Jesus searches out his sheep. Never forget this. Never be so proud to think you found Jesus. I've heard people tell testimonies about how life was okay, but then it became really something when they found God. And I'm not sure it was God that they found. Jesus is the one who seeks us. And you know this if you've been saved. Even if you grew up in a Christian home, you know that's how God saved you, right? You didn't birth yourself into that home, did you? If you did, I want a picture of it. <laughs> that was Christ's work and his finding you. No matter your story, if you are Christ, it's because he sought you, he bought you, and he redeemed you by his blood. Now notice one more thing here about the work of Christ. It's not finished when he finds the sheep. No, he rejoices. In another passage, Jesus says the shepherd returns home and tells everyone about finding the sheep. And it's, it, it seems strange to me. There, he tells a story about a woman losing a coin and then she finds it and then throws a party to tell everybody about it. I don't know if that would do that, but Jesus does. Right? That's actually the most wonderful thing about this. Jesus rejoices over his lost sheep when they're found. The whole host of heaven rejoice. 
There is great glory in heaven over the little ones who are brought to safety by Christ. And if you know yourself, this is hard to imagine. But Jesus, the holy, perfect, and blameless one, he would lay down his life for a sinner like you, and then he would rejoice over you? That the heavens would celebrate you? That ought to humble us, and how ought to encourage us. Now, if heaven rejoices, then you know why we gather each Sunday, don't we? And you know why we're commanded to rejoice. Like, if our Savior rejoices, how much more should we? Scripture says rejoice, and again I say rejoice. And it's not a command where, you know, sometimes you give, as dads, you give commands and you don't obey them yourself. That's not what that is. Jesus obeys the commands, and he rejoices. We ought to be people known for our joyous worship of the King. And we ought to join in the singing and praising with our rejoicing Savior. And that's a reason why we gather each week, because we have been lost sheep who have been found. Furthermore, we need to be praying for more opportunities to rejoice. We ought to be like the Son in rejoicing and in the work. Notice that in verse 14, Jesus says when speaking about the Father, he says, your Father. Doesn't say my father, your father. Jesus calls his father our father. And if so, this means we are sons of God. And if the son does the work of the father, what should the other sons do? The work of the father. Thank you. Should we not follow the firstborn's motto? Should we not be those who leave behind our comfort zones? who go and search and find with the gospel those who are lost. Should we not be those looking for lost sheep? Again, we have the whole city of Jeffersonville before us. There are many lost sheep here. Many sheep without shepherds. And you want to rejoice, and we want to fill this place with rejoicing, we've got to find some lost sheep. Now finally, this last thing I want to say, if there will be joy in heaven for the finding in one of those little ones, what wrath in heaven is there for despising them? And that leads us back to the beginning, right? Be careful that you do not despise the little ones. Let us be mindful that we're to love, with each, other, love each other. And let our love not be fake, superficial love that encourages sin. You know, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1, 9 through 11, he said, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Notice the Apostle Paul prays that our love will grow, but he's not praying for the worldly definition, the world definition of love. He prays that it would grow with knowledge and discernment. Our love is not just emotional fluff. It's love with wisdom. We grow in this love so that we can approve what is excellent. Christian love discerns what is wise. It makes judgments about what is good and is bad. And then it approves what is excellent. So that the ones loving and being loved would be pure and blameless. Compare this with the love of the world that says to love, we must approve all manner of evil. Romans chapter 1, verse 32 describes this love when it said, which is really no love at all. It says, Though they know Christ's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. That's the world's love. But let us give ourselves to sincere love without hypocrisy. Let's confess our sins to each other and forgive each other of our sins. Let's build each other up in the holiness of God. Let's spur one another on to good works, the work of the sons for the Father. And so, brothers and sisters, let none of us despise the little ones. Let's love them. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that the Father, that you do not will to lose any of your little ones. And so we entrust ourselves to your care. We trust that even when we sin, we fail, we, we, we are unrighteous at times, we 
trust that you will not lose us because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to love each other. Forgive us when we have despised each other. And help us to uh, be those who join you in the work. Help us now to make an impact here in Jeffersonville for your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory be to the Father. celebrate the Holy Communion of the body and blood of our dear Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, listen to the words of the institution of the Holy Supper as these were delivered by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians. He writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, as you drink it in remembrance of me. For often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We have an opportunity now to display to each other the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? This is a meal that he has instituted, a sacrament for us to strengthen us in our faith, to encourage us, and for us to visibly proclaim the gospel that we've heard with our ears. And so this is a, this represents his body and blood. This is not actually his body and blood, as if this, these elements change, but Jesus is with us here. And so he is continuing his work with the Holy Spirit to strengthen his people so that he does not lose any of us. And so this is a meal for his people. It's a meal to remind us of the great hope that one day we will share with Christ Jesus face to face with a meal that will be the feast of all feasts. The feast of all feasts. And so this is a feast of many feasts to remind us of that feast in which there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more sin. What an amazing day. Now as we partake of this meal then, we're proclaiming some serious truths. And this is, as we proclaim these truths, these are truths that ought to be true of you. That Christ's blood has washed you clean. That he is making you holy. That he's brought peace to you and God and peace to your brothers and sisters. And so we don't want to be those false shepherds, false teachers, ourselves, coming forward to take this mill to proclaim something that's not true. And so I warn you, if you come to this mill to receive it but you don't have faith in Christ, you're counting on your own works righteousness to be saved, or you're in unrepentant sin that nobody knows about and you just keep going and, and your heart is given to that. You're trampling under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God says that's a very serious thing. Some are getting sick and dying. And so this mill is not for you if you do not, uh, if you have unrepentant sin and do not have faith in the Lord. Or if you have fought against your brothers and sisters. Right? You need to go and be at peace with them first before you come to this mill. Now, I warn you then, do not come to the mill with unrepentance. Having said that, though, perhaps your faith is weak. Perhaps you know that you struggle with sin, but you repent. And you just keep getting knocked down, and you keep getting up because you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a mill for his little ones. It's for those who trust him. And so he does beckon you to come if you are his. So I want to encourage you, if you have faith in Christ, and you're striving that holiness that he requires and you're striving by faith, then come. One more thing to say that I'm going to pray is that this bill is for brothers and sisters in Christ. And brothers and sisters in Christ are part of churches. They're part of a church. Right? That's what God called you to do, to be a part of his people. And so this is not, again, it's not a mill for individuals. It's a mill for the church. And therefore, we ask, if you're a member of a church somewhere, even if you're not a member of Sovereign King, or you're looking to become a member somewhere, this meal's for you. But if you're if you're just not, if you're determined to be an, uh, a, 
What do you want to call it? A, a lone island, thank you. A lone ranger, something like that. You're determined to be all by yourself. We ask you not to take it in this in your life. So let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Let's pray that God would use the, these uh, these uh, elements for our good. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who admits your people into such wonderful communion, that partaking of the body and blood of your dear Son, they should dwell in him and he in them. We unworthy sinners approach your presence. We behold your glory. And we despise ourselves. And we repent in dust and ashes. We have grievously sinned against you, Lord, in thought, word, and deed. We've broken our past vows. We've dishonored your holy name. And we are unworthy of the least of all your mercies. We are sheep that have gone astray. Yet now, most gracious Father, have mercy upon us. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, forgive us all our sins. Purify us from uncleanness in spirit and in flesh. Enable us heartily to forgive others as we ask you to forgive us. And grant that we may hereafter serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your holy name. O Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Grant us that peace. O God, who by the blood of your dear Son has opened for us a new and living way into the holiest of holies. We pray that you would grant us the assurance of your mercy, that you would sanctify us by your Holy Spirit, that drawing near to you with a pure heart and undefiled conscience, we would offer up to you a sacrifice of our bodies and of our praise in righteousness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to the Lord. All right, in a moment I'll invite you to the table. Again, if you have children who have not yet been baptized, professed faith, and have, and have not been admitted to the Lord's table, they're not permitted to take up this meal. It is for baptized and professing believers. But uh, we do invite you to bring them forward. Mr. Cox and uh, Mr. Sabe will be with me on either side and be glad to pray for you and your family and uh, pray a blessing over you. So now, beloved, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. You may now come and eat. The civil just come by rows and grab your meal and go back down to your seat.
Dearly beloved, the Lord has fed our souls at his table and in his word today. I hope you are encouraged and strengthened for this week to be in service to the Lord. Uh, before we stand and sing, I wanted to, uh, there were so many people that helped, and, and so it's hard to point out a few names, but I did want to uh, thank uh, Mrs. Anglin, uh, who did a lot to really help us with the decoration, and then Mr. Owen, who came and gave a lot of work to help get the sound and all that stuff. And everybody else that helped as well. But, uh, thank you for your, your work. Well, let's stand and let's praise, uh, let's praise the Lord again. Let's go forth one mission for the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd. Thank you. 